So my talk today uh, is about laser-based phase contrast uh, in transmission electron microscopy. And uh, since this is a math institute, I wanted to focus on, on some of the associated computational opportunities, which we're currently in the process of exploring. Uh, but we're in the physics department. I work with uh, Professor Holger Mueller and also uh, Bob Glazer. Uh, this um, this uh, sort of a joint collaboration that's been going on for some time. And so we, we do mostly experimental work for the time being, um, but we're also excited about a lot of the, the, the ways in which our phase plate device can uh, change imaging systems uh, in TEM. So, uh, oop, on, great. So uh, my talk is divided into three parts. In the first part, I wanna talk about uh, phase contrast microscopy and how we plan to do it with a laser and why and what that really does to the microscope's transfer function. In the second part of the talk, I'll transition into these various computational opportunities, uh, which have been explored uh, largely in theory and, and with a, a little bit of experiment. Um, but I'll, I'll go through quite, quite a number of them um, very briefly and sort of whet your appetite, I hope, for some of the computational problems that lie ahead. And in the third part, I'll give some updates uh, on the experimental side of things, um, which, uh, yeah you'll hear about. So in this first part, uh, I want to start by thinking about how biomolecules behave in the microscope and why phase contrast is worth doing. So uh, when we think about biomolecules in a uh, TEM, uh, they are weak phase objects, meaning that they interact very weakly with the illuminating electron beam. And we can think of that as them imparting a small phase shift phi onto the uh, the electron beam. So if I have some electron wave function described by a plane wave, when I send it through my specimen, I accrue some phase term here. And by sort of expanding this phase term, you can see an unscattered component of the beam that just passes through the sample unperturbed, and then a scattered component which contains the information phi about the biomolecule. So this is the information that we actually want to extract. And what we find, unfortunately, is that if we propagate this wave function through the rest of the microscope and we measure the square modulus on the electron detector, we don't have any information about phi in the image. That is to say, we don't know anything about the biomolecule. Or equivalently, we have no contrast. Um, so traditionally, the way that contrast is introduced in the microscope is by defocusing the microscope. Uh, but this turns out to be a suboptimal way to impart phase contrast. And in particular, uh, we can describe it in the diffraction plane by this quadratic phase, which depends, uh, which goes as the square of the spatial frequency s. Um, and the way to optimally image weak phase objects was uh, first developed in the 40s by Fritz Zernicke uh, in the context of optical microscopy, which has uh, a lot of the same math. And uh, there the idea, uh, the key observation is that scattered and unscattered beams are spatially separated in the diffraction plane of the microscope. So if we sort of trace out the purple and orange rays here, you can see that the purple beam, the unscattered beam, comes to a focus here. And the... Uh, the scattered electrons do not focus there. So uh, the idea is that if we place a phase plate, an object, in the diffraction plane, we can actually separately phase modulate the two components of the beam. And so if I place an, uh, an optic here, a component, into the microscope, then I can phase shift uh, just that unscattered component. And if I apply a 90 degree phase shift, that turns out to be the optimal amount of uh, phase transformation to this beam, such that when I look at the uh, detector now, phi is uh, linear in the image intensity, or rather the image intensity is linear in phi. And so from this, we get perfect contrast about our weak phase object. Now, this was developed in optical microscopy a long time ago and is pretty standard. You can buy uh, for a couple hundred bucks, a phase contrast microscope that works really well uh, with photons. But this turns out to be very difficult to implement with electrons because electrons are just very sensitive to their environment. They're easily deflected by electric and magnetic fields. And on top of that, uh, electrons in an electron microscope are very damaging to whatever sort of material object we place in the path of the electron beam. They charge it up, they have mass, they destroy it. Um, and so this leads to a lot of complications with actually building a phase plate. And so that's been an ongoing effort. Um, and the most successful implementation to date has been uh, this uh, so-called Volta phase plate, which consists of uh, simply a thin carbon film. And the idea is that the unscattered beam, which is much more intense than the weak scattered beam, uh, 
uh, comes to a focus here and induces some sort of radiation-dependent change in the carbon film, which in turn causes a phase shift of the unscattered beam relative to the scattered orange one. And uh, as you can see from this experimental data here, uh, as you take many images with the uh, Volta faceplate, the amount of phase shift between the scattered and unscattered beams builds up. At some point, they go to a new position, so we start back at the bottom. Um, and all this is to say that the phase shift is not particularly stable over time. Because you have to build it up with this sort of uh, radiation-dependent effect, you can either uh, accept this sort of time dependence of your phase shift, or you can maybe try to precondition it and only image near this pi over 2 phase shift that you actually want. Um, but we'd like to improve upon that. Uh, the second uh, big problem with the Volta faceplate is that there is quite a bit of scattering of electrons away from the detector, so you lose about 20% of your electrons when imaging with a Volta faceplate. And as we know, in cryo-EM, we're already dealing with low enough signal-to-noise that we really want to hang on to as many of our electrons as possible. Um, so our approach uh, in, uh, in this collaboration between uh, Holger and Bob's groups is uh, to implement a laser faceplate. So the idea is, rather than to put a material object into the electron beam, to use a laser. Uh, and the idea there comes from the uh, interaction of stimulated Compton scattering between electrons and photons. And so you can think of this as an electron basically absorbing and emitting uh, a photon very rapidly, over the course of which it gets a small phase shift. Um, equivalently, you can also think of it as an electron feeling sort of a ponder mode of potential proportional to the square of the electric field that it sees from this laser beam. Uh, or in other words, proportional to the intensity. Now, this has a lot of potential advantages. So uh, we can produce very stable laser intensities. And the laser intensity being proportional to the phase shift means that we can produce a very stable phase shift. It also means that we don't put any material object into the path of the electron beam, which means that you know, we can't charge up the photons with the, with the incident electric beam. We can't uh, electron beam. We can't uh, damage the phase plate. Uh, and so this um, should provide a really nice phase plate. But it has one sort of technical challenge, which is that the stimulated Compton scattering interaction that I'm describing is really weak. And the phase shift that you get from scattering an electron off of one photon is very small. And so to accumulate 90 degrees of phase shift, you require an extreme light intensity. And for a 300 kilovolt electron beam, for example, that light intensity uh, is about 400 gigawatts per square centimeter. And if you're not used to those kinds of units, that's about a trillion times more intense than this laser pointer. Uh, and so that is difficult to achieve. Uh, it can be done in a variety of ways with pulsed lasers, uh, which I won't go into. Suffice it to say that pulsed electron guns are, are uh, pretty complicated. Um, and uh, essentially don't exist to the level that we would like them to. So our solution uses a continuous wave laser beam. Uh, so here's a schematic of the laser faceplate device. And I'll go into more detail uh, about the technical aspects of the laser faceplate uh, at the, in the third part of the talk. But for now, uh, I just want to give you an idea for what we're really working with here. So here's a, a schematic of our microscope column. You can see the electron beam in green. And the unscattered beam comes to a focus in our magnified diffraction pattern. And um, so the laser comes in through the side of the column, enters our device, which is a cavity. So the idea with the optical cavity is that it will amplify the light beam by sending the, uh, by, uh, by basically having highly reflective mirrors that bounce the beam around many times. So the beam's effective path length is sort of folded in on itself many times here. And that allows us to accumulate an amplified power of about 7,000 fold from our input of about 15 watts of continuous wave IR laser light. Uh, so, um, and additionally, the cavity also has curved mirror surfaces. And that means that our uh, cavity mode has a focus here, uh, down to about 8 microns. And together, this amplification and this focusing of the laser beam produces actually this 400 gigawatt per square centimeter light intensity. And um, just so that you know that the stuff that I'm about to say uh, is not, you know, entirely uh, without any sort of basis of fact. We have actually you know, achieved this in the lab. Um, and what I want to focus on for the next couple of slides is just what exactly this does to the, um, what exactly this does to the transfer function of the microscope. So normally, when we think about the CTF, the transfer function, the contrast transfer function, as it were, uh, this tells us about the information transfer at each spatial frequency. So here, for the case of just defocusing the microscope, we often plot these sort of concentric circles, which represent the quadratic phase uh, coming from defocus that sort of wraps in 
uh, around 2 pi, and you see these oscillations here. And so I'm plotting this on a log scale in spatial frequency here versus its uh, azimuthal average. And you can see for defocus in blue how we have uh, essentially no contrast at very low spatial frequencies. And at some point, we, uh, we start to get some phase contrast, and then uh, we start to see these rapid oscillations. So what the phase plate, what our laser phase plate does, is it adds this sort of stripe that you can see across the x-axis here. And uh, the stripe actually comes from the fact that because we have the laser beam trapped between two mirrors, we're forming a standing wave, right? So there's some boundary conditions set by the mirrors, and that results in a standing wave pattern that has a bunch of fringes of high and low intensity. And these manifest as uh, positions of high and low uh, phase contrast right in this uh, center region. But of course, uh, what we do is we align the unscattered beam, the unscattered electron beam, to a, a region of high intensity of the laser beam. And that means that we have a 90 degree phase shift of this beam with respect to the uh, scattered beam elsewhere. So over here we have a nice 90 degree phase shift, on top of which we also have some defocus here. So I'm, I'm continuing to add a defocus term here. And so when we look at what this does to our uh, contrast transfer function, we can see that uh, we have a much improved low frequency contrast. And we have sort of similar performance at high spatial frequencies, and I'll get into that uh, a little bit more. Um, but first, let's take a closer look at what gives rise to this particular shape. So first of all, uh, this sort of oscillation that you're seeing here is just from averaging over this sort of striped pattern. Um, but there are two important frequencies that determine the performance of the phase plate. The first, uh, what we call cut-on frequency, where the, where the CTF uh, increases here, is determined by the laser wavelength, right? So these, uh, the laser wavelength defines how closely spaced all of these fringes are, all these vertical lines. And the first place that has sort of phase contrast, you know, the lowest frequency that has space, uh, phase contrast is just translated from an antinode of this standing wave into a node. And so that's the spacing of lambda over four. Uh, the second place where we get uh, even more phase contrast is once we're out of this laser profile altogether, which is described by the laser waste radius of eight microns. So this is really magnified compared to what you saw on the previous slide, which really defines how thin this stripe is in the back focal plane. So uh, these two together sort of uh, tell us about the low spatial frequency enhancement. And then the high spatial frequencies here are sort of de determined by other factors. So they're not unique to the phase plate. So the high frequency oscillations we still have because we're still operating at a defocus here uh, in, this, in this simulation. And also we have uh, high frequency attenuation due to the coherence envelope of the electron beam, and that is also not changed by our device. So um, that's kind of a, a, an introduction to uh, what, we're, uh, what we're working with. And now I want to go into a variety of different uh, sort of computational opportunities, which we're exploring to various degrees and, and you know, excited about to various degrees. But I wanted to sort of uh, share them with you and, and, and see sort of what, what kinds of things you all are interested in, and if, if uh, there's anything else that you would like to talk about, I'm, I'm very excited to talk about uh, these various ideas. Um, so, yeah, getting into it, the, the first one is electron tomography, right? So uh, we've heard a lot about tomography, and as we know, cryo-electron tomography enables volumetric reconstruction of these kinds of uh, biomolecule samples. Uh, the idea being to just tilt the sample to different angles and acquire slices through its 3D Fourier transform. Uh, this faces a couple of experimental challenges. One is that uh, the radiation uh, sensitivity of the sample means that we have a very small electron budget, and we have to spread it thinly across uh, a few tens of images in practice, and so that's governed by this uh, Crowther limit here. Um, and uh, the other big trade-off that we have to make in a, in a tomogram is that uh, defocus-based contrast in the absence of a phase plate requires us to choose between high and low spatial frequencies. So you can defocus more, uh, increasing the curvature of your parabola, and you can uh, get more low frequency information at the cost that the CTF is going to be oscillating wildly at high spatial frequencies. Um, the phase plate allows us to sort of get around both of these challenges a little bit. So the first way in which it helps is that you get all this extra low spatial frequency information essentially for free. and Hopefully, this will allow us to reduce the minimum dose per image. Right? You can imagine that having a lot more information at these low spatial frequencies provides a lot of context um, and provides the ability to improve alignments, 
and reduce the amount of exposure that's actually needed in order to interpret a micrograph and make use of the electrons that we detect. Uh, the second improvement is that the phase plate uh, imparts this sort of advantage on the low spatial frequencies without really doing anything to the high spatial frequencies. And what this means is that we can work around this trade-off of uh, high and low spatial frequency. And we just get this extra information. And we can even take this a little further. We can add uh, spherical aberration correction. Uh, and so in the case where we have spherical aberration correction and also go to defocus uh, of zero, we find that the laser faceplate allows us to actually capture a continuous band with no zeros in the CTF here, all the way between, between zero and where the coherence envelope uh, sort of dies off. And this could be tremendously important for tomography uh, or, you know, electron microscopy generally, where we, where we normally have to sample different positions, uh, different defocus positions, to move these nodes around to get information at all these spatial frequencies. Now we can collect all of that information uh, without having to do these kinds of things. Uh, and in tomography, where we have a very heterogeneous sample with the different uh, constituents at different, of different sizes, uh, and not all of them are very clearly identified, uh, having this kind of full spectrum information can be very valuable. So, um, another way, uh, so, oh, what happened there? I hit the wrong button. Yeah, great. Um, so, uh, el elaborating a little bit more on spherical aberration is the next thing I want to do. So, correcting spherical aberration in a microscope uh, for TEM is not something that a lot of people think about. Uh, and here is, in a nutshell, the, the reason. Um, if I, so here I'm going to show a simulation of a single carbon atom. And so in each, uh, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the defocus of the carbon atom and I'm going to simulate an image of it. And so for each image, I'm going to take a line scan through it and I'm going to plot that line scan at the corresponding defocus value here. So I've simulated it first for two configurations. One is a standard microscope with a reasonable amount of spherical aberration. And another one has no spherical aberration. So neither of these have a phase plate. But what, what I want to point out about these is we're essentially taking uh, uh, sort of an xz slice through the point spread function of the microscope, which is the inverse Fourier transform of the CTF. And what you can see is that for the standard microscope, this is very insensitive to defocus. So as we vary defocus uh, up and down here, the, the PSF doesn't change very much. On the other hand, for the aberration corrected uh, PSF, we get a, a much stronger dependence on z, and we see uh, an overall improvement of sort of the peak contrast. We get uh, regions of, of darker blue and darker red here than, than, than we do in the standard case. Um, but we also get this contrast inversion around zero, right? So we have this sort of tight localization uh, laterally, and we have this contrast inversion. Um, and this makes it sort of difficult to work with, and I'll show you on the next slide what sort of the consequences are of just using a spherical aberration corrector without a phase plate. But if we add a phase plate into the mix, we find that this actually greatly enhances the potential of spherical aberration correction. So uh, if we have a microscope that has an aberration, a spherical aberration corrector, and also a laser face plate, we get the following PSF here, which has a much tighter uh, localization of signal in 3D and a much uh, more enhanced contrast overall. So this is a pretty tantalizing figure. Um, I think it says that we can potentially sharpen uh, the foreground of an image. Things that are in focus will have this very intense contrast. Things that are far away will have uh, a weak contribution to the data. Uh, and so this ability for sort of optical sectioning uh, is, is pretty interesting, and I'll, I'll talk about that more uh, in a couple of slides. Um, the other point to make here is that we really start to approach the diffraction-limited performance of such an optical system. Um, and so what does this really do to, for example, the image of a molecule? So here I'm simulating a uh, myoglobin uh, molecule and in the same three configurations that you saw before. So in the standard configuration, we see regions of positive and negative contrast, and we see relatively low spatial frequency information uh, laterally. In the aberration corrected case, because we're operating very close to this contrast inversion, if we try to take advantage of sort of the highest contrast region, we end up with uh, this tight localization. We end up with high uh, spatial frequency information uh, laterally, but we end up with a lot of regions of, of, uh, of positive and negative contrast, and we end up with a lot of regions of no contrast. And so looking at this, even just qualitatively, you can see how, how uh, much fainter this image is. And of course, in the third case, where we have all the atoms uh, having negative contrast with the aberration-corrected laser faceplate, uh, 
we also get all the benefits of the aberration corrected case alone. But now, by getting rid of this contrast inversion, we really enhance the point spread function. Um, and we really uh, make this a very crisp image with a lot of high spatial frequency information and also strong negative contrast throughout. Uh, an important note about this is that the simulation includes a continuum mod model of the solvent, which is obviously glossing over some of the details. Uh, in reality, we're going to have a bunch of solvent uh, molecules all around here. Uh, and so it, it remains to be seen kind of what that, what that really means in the context of, of experiments and, and analyzing real data. Um, so another sort of interesting thing about this tightly localized PSF is that uh, it, it sort of uh, draws an analogy to fluorescence microscopy, where uh, in, in optical microscopy, people use high numerical aperture systems with, with uh, very nicely corrected wavefronts uh, at operating at the diffraction limit to really look at volumes in a different way. So rather than tilting the sample in, in sort of a projection approximation where your electron integrates through the whole potential, they uh, use the tight localization of the signal to perform a focal series where they just change the defocus of their objective and they obtain many slices through the sample. And then you can reconstruct the volume using this, this other means which actually just sort of relies on the fact that uh, atoms or you know, signal that's far away from your defocus will not uh, the, the, that's far away from your focal plane uh, will not contribute significantly to that image. Uh, this lends itself naturally to deconvolution and, and trying to improve resolution that way. Um, but uh, another interesting uh, aspect of this is that it replaces the Crowther limit with the Shannon limit, which is a factor of pi over 2 better. Uh, so it reduces potentially the number of images that you need to reconstruct a volume. Uh, but comparing them in a little more detail, you know, it's, 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 not, um, it's not immediately clear that we should drop tilt series altogether. Um, in fact, uh, there's, a, there's a big uh, point about radiation damage uh, that, I sh that I should make here. So in a, in a tilt series, uh, the radiation damage is sort of uh, dependent on spatial frequency, right? So the way, that, the way that we get it, we get the low spatial frequency information uh, all throughout our tilt series, and as we go to later exposures, the radiation damage destroys high frequency information. In a focal series, because our images are stacked uh, along the Z axis, we end up with uh, radiation damage which varies with axial position. And this might ultimately end up being very unappealing. But there are some other appealing aspects about focal series. Uh, so this, this uh, background reduction that I talked about, um, as well as the reduction in the sampling limit. Uh, importantly, focal series don't have any missing wedge artifact. Um, as compared with tilt series. And uh, the, uh, another sort of appealing experimental aspect of it is that uh, stage tilt in a tilt series is actually uh, difficult to do, leads to a lot of uh, slow experiments and a lot of uh, hassle c um, correcting, essentially registering images together uh, and additional, additional problems with charging. Um, and scanning the objective defocus is a relatively much easier thing to do experimentally. So we definitely have to weigh the, the benefits uh, of, of each of these two methods here. Uh, and we might imagine that we could take advantage of some sort of hybrid scheme that combines the two, um, or some sort of interleaved uh, approach to focal series. Um, those are just some, some ideas to throw out there. Uh, another avenue that we're excited about for, for the laser faceplate is uh, template matching. And we'll hear uh, more about that today. But my, uh, my sort of contribution to this, what I want to emphasize about it is, uh, so the, the, the idea of template matching is we have a, a micrograph uh, like the one shown here with, with many uh, ribosomes distributed throughout. We create a library of template images and uh, cross-correlate them with the image. So the template images are ribosomes at different orientations. And the cross-correlation allows us to assign orientations and positions to the, the molecules that we see here. And something very tantalizing to us about this is the, uh, the Grigoriev lab notes that the, uh, the phase plate improves detection signal to noise ratio uh, with this approach. And so we're hopeful that by combining the phase plate with high resolution template matching, we'll be able to extract uh, particles from, you know, which are smaller and which are located in, in more crowded environments. Um, and another uh, interesting, 
uh, aspect is that removing low frequency structural noise, in other words, uh, sort of background contributions from, from other molecules, uh, improves particle detection. Uh, and so the, to that end, uh, as sort of an aside, I wanted to mention a sort of a proposal for a uh, background subtraction uh, approach, which is sort of separate and can be combined with uh, high resolution template matching as well as, um, as, well as the phase plate. Um, so this consists of taking two types of data. The first is an untilted image. Uh, so this is your sort of template matching data set. You have high resolution information here and you also of course have low resolution information. And you acquire this until you're happy, until you've destroyed all the high resolution information. And then you transition to taking a low resolution tilt series. So this has common information with the untilted image, but it also gives you a lot of information about the axial uh, positions of everything. It gives you 3D context, in other words. And this complements the untilted image in a way that I can sort of describe through this, uh, this illustration here. So we have a phantom consisting of a proteasome, an RNA polymerase, and a ribosome. And they're all stacked along the optical axis of the electron microscope, such that an image of, uh, of the three proteins produces this sort of garbled mess that's hard to disentangle. Uh, in other words, it produces a lot of uh, low frequency structural noise. Uh, and so in order to remove the low frequency structural noise, we leverage our tilt series information which allows us to produce a low resolution uh, 3D volume here of the two particles uh, in principle, perhaps even the third. But so the idea is to take these two, maybe mask out the density that we get here and project uh, them onto the XY plane to get this low resolution reconstruction of the two larger particles. And then by subtracting image D from image C, we get a difference image which reveals uh, the, the position of the, the third particle uh, superposed with some of the high frequency structural noise coming from the large proteins, which we didn't subtract, of course, because it was not contained in the tilt series. Uh, and so for comparison, you can see an image just of the, uh, just of the RNA polymerase at, at high resolution. So, um, changing to yet another topic, uh, going beyond sort of the weak phase limit uh, where um, only a phase modulation is imparted on the electron beam. If there is some small amplitude contribution, if there is some uh, weak scattering term mu, which doesn't, which doesn't carry this complex uh, exponential, uh, we can actually recover both using two images with, with and without a laser phase plate. So I showed how turning the phase plate on captures information about phi. And if we just turn the phase plate off, we actually capture information about mu, right? So then we can combine these uh, two bits of information to reconstruct our whole complex wave function here. And the phase plate can actually approximate this. So the first image just being acquired with the phase plate on. So here I'm showing again the zoom in on the, on the laser standing wave and then zooming further in, we can see the alignment here of the unscattered beam to one of the high intensity regions of the laser standing wave. And we can acquire phase plate off images in one of two ways. We can either uh, simply move the electron beam into a node of the standing wave or, and this turns out to be more uh, difficult to do in practice, we can just blink the laser phase plate off. Um, the reason this is more difficult to do is that uh, basically uh, there's a lot of heat load on the, the mirrors when they're operating with uh, this huge light intensity inside of them, between them. And when we turn that off, there's some drifts. Uh, so this is an experimental direction that, that we're interested in is, is can you actually turn this phase plate on and off, and, and how does that work with all of the, the feedback systems? And I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about that uh, in the last part of the talk. Um, so these methods of exit wave reconstruction also work best at zero defocus and, and with uh, spherical aberration correction. Um, but imaging accurately at low defocus is, is definitely a, a research endeavor. It's definitely something that we're going to have to spend some time uh, figuring out how to do. Um, people don't really do it, and so we need to uh, work around <laughs> we need to work around that and develop methods to actually perform this accurately and also analyze the data. Um, one last topic that I want to cover uh, in this second part of the talk is uh, ghost images. So one of the one of the features of the laser phase plate, is that it looks like a phase grading, right? So uh, the word grading uh, to any physicist means that there's going to be diffraction involved somewhere. And indeed, we get diffraction of the electrons, which 
produces our sort of main image, our zeroth order diffraction. So this is our, our negative contrast uh, image. So this is obviously a simulation. This is an image of a proteasome. And we see uh, along the laser axis, we get regularly spaced uh, diffraction images. So we get uh, zeroth, we get first order images, we get second order images. Uh, but so I'm highlighting here the first order images, which are weak compared to the first order image. Uh, and they have inverted contrast, but they are still certainly present. Uh, the spacing of those images uh, is, of course, defined by some of the spatial scales at play here. So we have the laser wavelength, the focal length of the objective, and the electron wavelength. Um, and so what does this mean for our uh, images? Well, it essentially means that we've delocalized our point spread function uh, over many, uh, many regions. We've de delocalized it along that one axis. And so in principle, this can be uh, this can be difficult to work with, right? So if I have a particle very close to the edge of the field of view, its ghost image will be off the camera, and I won't detect it, and that'll make it harder to analyze. Likewise, something that sits outside of the camera can have its ghost appear onto the sensor. Uh, and so that's something that we need to work on in more detail, and we have a few proposals for how to kind of reduce or eliminate ghost images, uh, but they all have some, some uh, trade-offs. So the most sort of radical way to get rid of ghosts is to take advantage of the relativistic reversal of the ponder motive potential. Uh, and I won't go into a lot of detail about that. You can, you can read Jeremy Axelrod's paper here um, if you're interested. So the idea, uh, briefly, is that uh, when electrons are relativistic, uh, by tuning the polarization of the laser beam, we can change the nature of this ponder motive potential such that uh, we essentially reverse the effect. And that also means that there's essentially a zero crossing where the difference between the nodes and antinodes uh, is zero. And so the phase shift all along the laser stripe is uh, the same. And that means that uh, we essentially get rid of this grading structure. And if we get rid of the grading, then we get rid of the diffraction orders. So this is a, a perfect solution uh, in the sense of analytically removing these, these ghost images. Um, but it comes with a downside, which is that uh, the first cut on frequency of the faceplate was determined by this standing wave structure of the, of the beam. And if we get rid of that, then we have to accept a cut on frequency that's 20-fold higher. Uh, and maybe we don't want to do that. So um, we have a few uh, partial correction schemes uh, in mind that uh, re retain this, this uh, first cut on um, coming from the laser standing wave but try to just reduce the contribution of these ghost images. So um, in this first panel here, I'm showing a single faceplate and the main image of a proteasome and the, and the first ghost and showing line scans uh, through these two images in, in black here. And then in, in red, I'm showing an, another type of uh, faceplate idea we have, which is the crossed laser faceplate. So now there are two laser stripes, one along the x-axis and one along the y. Uh, and what this does is it reduces the uh, ghost intensity by a factor of three or four, uh, which can be uh, probably quite substantial when you think about how weak these images are to begin with. Um, and it also brings an extra benefit, which is that it reduces the cavity power requirements. We obviously still need to pass electrons through the same number of photons uh, to get a 90 degree phase shift, but now being able to spread that between two phase plates uh, actually does bring some advantages in the sense that operating cavities at higher and higher powers becomes more and more difficult. Um, being able to reduce that power by 50% should, should help a lot. So um, one more uh, sort of zanier idea for subtracting ghosts away from an image is to take two images in sequence, kind of similar to this exit wave reconstruction scheme. Um, but instead of, uh, but, but again, leveraging the crossed base plate. So here I'm showing, sort of zooming in on the, uh, this uh, waffle looking pattern. So what this actually is, is uh, horizontal stripes from one phase plate and vertical stripes from the other. And we have our unscattered beam shown here. And by sampling a couple of regions of this, of this potential, uh, I can produce two different images which have the same contrast for the zeroth order peak, the zeroth order image, but they have opposite signs for the ghosts. And simply adding these two together, we end up with a nice field of view that reduces these, these ghosts significantly. So this is uh, kind of a, a, a very um, you know, uh, arbitrary kind of math trick, uh, which doesn't work perfectly, 
but it does significantly reduce the density uh, and uh, actually kind of plays nicely with some of the other uh, exit wave reconstruction ideas that you can implement with a cross phase plate. Um, so that's yet another way we're hoping to reduce ghost images. Um, in the third part of the talk now, I want to just give some updates about experimental progress that we've made. Um, so uh, in case you were wondering, the phase plate uh, is, uh, is, does exist and, and, and mostly, mostly works. Um, and I'll go through some of the uh, ways in which we've, we've already demonstrated it and some of the, some of the challenges uh, that, that we're facing and that we have faced. Um, but here it is, uh, a photo of our, of our microscope. So it's an FEI Titan 8300 microscope. And it has a custom transfer optics module. So it has an extra section in the column. Uh, the reason for that is that the sample, uh, the, the actual back focal plane, the first diffraction plane of the, of the microscope, is located immediately below the sample. And there's basically only enough space there to slide in uh, an objective aperture and not enough space for the whole face plate. So uh, we have this extra module which has an extra uh, lens and produces uh, a magnified diffraction pattern in the microscope. And so we put our phase plate inside of that module. It also gives us a little bit more, more space to access everything. So it gives us about an inch of space. And we put our phase plate in there. Um, the accompanying stuff that you see strapped to the microscope is the various uh, optics associated with the laser beam and also the laser amplifier here. Um, so it produces this 50 watts of light that travels along an optical fiber onto this table and then bounces around here, uh, goes into the, um, into the face plate. Some of the light is reflected out, some of the light is transmitted through. Uh, we make some measurements there to um, monitor the beam and we also uh, tune the wave front of the beam to, to match it to, to the cavity mode. Um, and so ultimately, with this 50 watt fiber amplifier, we make about 100 kilowatts of circulating power just inside the cavity. Um, on top of that, we have a rack here of just feedback electronics that control both the laser wavelength and also the cavity mount itself is, is adjusted to make sure that the cavity stays on resonance. So here's a photo of, of one of the face plates. Um, so this is sitting in a flow bench. We work under pretty strict vacuum conditions um, and make this, this uh, device which sits on the end of a long aluminum rod. And you can see here in a, in a CAD model how that rod is inserted into the microscope. So it, it just clamps onto, that, uh, onto the actual vacuum chamber, sticks inside. The electron beam comes vertically down through the microscope and goes through the face plate. And so taking a, a side view of the face plate here where the laser beam is coming uh, from the left and going to the right, uh, when, it, when it enters the, the cavity, it, it uh, goes through this first mirror and then uh, eventually hits the second mirror here and bounces around many times inside, about 10,000 times, before leaving in one of the two directions. Um, the mirrors also focus the light down onto this small hole, and that's where the electron beam goes through. So the electron beam shoots straight down through there and interacts with our, our laser. Uh, in order to keep everything stable, we have a flexure in this aluminum mount which uh, allows this uh, output, this second mirror, to be oriented with respect to the first one dynamically. And we have some feedback that tunes the laser wavelength uh, and also tunes the, uh, the position of this output mirror using uh, a set of piezos that just push on this flexure. So um, all that is to say that uh, this cavity is a pretty sophisticated piece of engineering. Uh, that meets a lot of, of uh, specifications. So we have to obviously work with uh, something that uh, is compatible with the vacuum of the microscope and also works with non-magnetic materials so as not to interfere with the electron beam. And the most critical component really of this, of this whole assembly is the mirrors, which need to handle 100 kilowatts of circulating power without uh, dissipating that power as heat into the system or doing so as little as possible. So they're super polished to about an angstrom of surface roughness or even a little bit less. And they have a really nice surface figure to help with the, the cavity mode uh, quality. So using this device in the lab, we've shown that over a uh, time scale of hours, we can produce a really stable circulating power. And as I mentioned, a stable power means that we can produce a stable phase shift. Uh, we've also demonstrated that the device can work for over 400 hours uh, in our hands without any sort of degradation. Uh, and in fact, we haven't yet um, seen any signs of, of uh, degradation from the cavity. Uh, 
Um, and we've uh, been able to achieve about 120 degrees total of phase shift. So obviously we, we would like to work at 90 or, or sort of close to 90, um, but being able to uh, reach a slightly higher phase shift is of course uh, a nice little buffer. Um, so our uh, sort of main event here is the actual imaging. So what does this do to the, the micrographs? So here I have uh, a micrograph showing proteasomes imaged with a one and a half microns of defocus. Um, with just defocus and no phase plate. And when we turn our laser on in the same sample, you can see how the low spatial frequency contrast is enhanced to the point where this image becomes very easily interpretable uh, from a distance. Um, so that's the kind of phase contrast that we're looking at. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we have these ghost images, um, and yet uh, they're sort of hard to make out. And we, we haven't actually uh, done a lot of work yet on developing sort of custom analysis tools. Um, that would take, uh, take into account the ghosts and, and take into account the laser stripe explicitly. So we analyzed this data set using a standard rely on 3.1 workflow, um, which estimates a phase shift between the scattered and unscattered beams, but doesn't, doesn't really treat the entire laser stripe or try to account for the ghosts or, or, or do any special pre-processing to that effect. Uh, and so with that reconstruction, we reached uh, a resolution of about 3.8 angstroms from 4,700 particles. And you can see this distribution of phase shifts of the, of the particles that ultimately contributed to that reconstruction. Uh, and it's a, it's a pretty nice, tight distribution. We can, we can you know, uh, we're, there's an ongoing effort on our part to uh, improve the alignment uh, between the electron beam and the laser beam sort of throughout an experiment. So these are two components that drift with respect to each other. And, and so there's, there's that sort of limitation coming in that, that broadens this distribution. Um, but this is a, a, a very nice initial demonstration uh, of how this method can work. And moving forward, we want to you know, improve the alignments um, and, of course, reproduce this kind of data and, and work with more exotic samples. Um, and in doing that, we've faced a few experimental challenges. Um, so a couple of them come from the microscope itself. So the transfer optics of the microscope uh, add additional spherical and chromatic aberration to the system. Um, and so to that end, we've installed a gun monochromator on our instrument that hopefully should improve the temporal coherence. Um, and we've also uh, encountered a problem of ice contamination. So our extra transfer optics module has about a tenfold worse vacuum pressure than the rest of the column. And so what that ends up uh, doing for us is basically a jet of water shoots up through the transfer optics right into the sample. <laughs> and uh, we, after discovering this, adding, added a vacuum pump onto the column and inserted an objective aperture into that back focal plane. And that improved things by about a factor of 10, so now we can image for a few hours at a time without suffering from ice contamination. And the third kind of most interesting uh, problem that we encountered uh, relates to thermal magnetic field noise. Uh, and I'll explain that in more detail on the next slide. Uh, but suffice it to say that the solution was to enlarge the electron beam hole. So previously I showed uh, a picture of the, of the cavity with a two millimeter diameter hole, and now we've increased that to eight. Uh, remember that this diameter, or this, uh, this full, yeah, this full diameter of the faceplate is, is 23 millimeters. Um, so why does enlarging the beam hole do anything? Well, um, essentially, um, we found that, uh, actually this, this effect has been, has been characterized in the literature, but we, we eventually found that uh, thermal fluctuations in the cavity mount can induce decoherence of the electron beam. So the cavity mount itself sits at uh, a uh, you know, room temperature or close to room temperature. And so the electrons in the aluminum of the cavity mount uh, are jiggling around a little bit. And that thermal excitement leads to small currents being generated sort of um, instantaneously. Those small currents produce small magnetic fields. And because all of that is happening uh, as a noise process, that is adding essentially random deflections to electrons moving through the column, uh, imaging electrons, and when those electrons land on the camera, they get slightly blurred out. Um, and it turns out that uh, systems with transfer optics are particularly sensitive to this because the effect gets worse with a higher distance of your marginal ray, uh, which we have in our, in our transfer optics. So uh, that was really a bummer. We showed that uh, by changing the size of the hole in just an aluminum rod, we can uh, improve that coherence envelope, and that's sort of our uh, characterization of, of this effect is pretty pretty well described by this model that kind of builds on uh, the previous work. Uh, 
Uh, and so now we've built this cavity with the larger, the larger hole, the one that I showed on, on the previous slide. We've put it in the microscope, and we're hoping that uh, you know, with uh, sort of wrestling with our with our slightly older instruments, that we can that we can make uh, make things work and start to churn out more data for everybody to have fun analyzing. Um, in the meantime, we've also commissioned a new microscope from Thermo Fisher, which is based around a Titan Krios G4. Uh, so this should really be a state-of-the-art instrument that's really tailored to uh, use with the laser faceplate. Uh, it has a transfer optics module that we worked with Thermo Fisher to improve uh, for our purposes, providing more space and also um, sort of variability in the focal length of the microscope, uh, which, as you'll recall, plays into some of the spatial scales uh, at play in the, in the laser faceplate CTF. Um, it also has an autoloader, which should really alleviate a lot of our, our, our vacuum woes. And it has a gun monochromator, likewise, for, for the uh, improved energy spread of the, of the beam. It has a post-column energy filter, which we're excited to use to start doing more tomography. Um, and it has a uh, latest generation camera, which replaces our, our K2 that we're currently using. Uh, and most excitingly, it has the spherical aberration corrector that I've been talking about, as well as room to implement this crossed phase plate, uh, which is uh, the, the design of which is underway in our lab. And so, uh, you know, hopefully, very soon we'll be able to really realize a lot of these effects uh, in experiments and make use of some of the different ideas that that I uh, that I tossed around today. And um, so, with that, I want to just briefly summarize the different topics. So on the faceplate development side, you know, I talked about these crossed faceplates and about how we want to start using spherical aberration correction and uh, working with in-focus imaging, sort of the ideal state for the uh, phase contrast imaging. And uh, additionally, we need a lot of we, there's there's a lot of uh, work to be done on the side of faceplate specific processing, handling these ghost images, uh, and also just accounting for the laser stripe in the CTF when we actually process data that we have not done so far. Um, Finally, there's uh, miniaturization of the cavity, uh, which I didn't really talk about today, but that's an ongoing effort to ideally remove transfer optics from the column entirely. And on the uh, experimental design uh, front, uh, I talked about how we can um, improve the contrast and hopefully leverage that to reduce the amount of exposure that's needed for meaningful images to be acquired, um, and uh, maybe make some changes to the way the tomography is done, perhaps utilizing fewer tilts or uh, taking advantage of focal series um, in, in, in place of tilt series, and uh, taking advantage of template matching as well in this background subtraction scheme that I talked about, as well as potentially doing exit wave reconstruction for uh, particles that have amplitude and also uh, phase contributions. Uh, so with that, I want to thank uh, Bob and Holger um, for their uh, you know, work with this and uh, the, the rest of uh, the faceplate team. And... Uh, the uh, alumni of the faceplate team were a pretty small group altogether. Um, we have a few collaborators who, who have uh, worked with us in the past and uh, some funding sources. And uh, thank you all for your attention.